and those are dry experiences. But long and short of it, give me a rousing UTD gamers welcome to producer, creator, video games fly, Tommy Tellerico. Massachusetts, New York, and uh, when I turned 21, I literally got in my car and drove to California. Uh, you know, parents crying on the doorstep, the whole thing. I just drove out there by myself, no job, no money, I didn't have any friends out there, no place to stay, nothing. I just drove. And um, when I got to California, um, I got a job selling uh, keyboards at a uh, guitar place. And one of the only T-shirts I brought with me was a was a, a video game T-shirt. And back then, this is 1990. No one had video game T-shirts. You know, back then. Now, I mean, you know, I see buy them here. Uh, you know, buy a topic. Walmart has. But back then, they were they were pretty rare. Uh, it was a Turbo Graphic 16 T-shirt. If anyone uh, remembers the Turbo Graphic 16, even more rare. Uh, but uh, and the first person who walked in. I happened to be a producer at a video game company. He was a producer at Virgin, you know, Richard Branson's company, and they were starting a video game company right down the street. And they asked me, they saw my shirt and asked me if I wanted a job. And uh, I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so um, I started working there. They asked me if I wanted to, you know, uh, I said, well, what do I have to do? And I said, well, just, you know, you play video games and pay you like five bucks an hour. You play video games and Tell us what's wrong with them. I'm like, <laughs> this is a great day. Um, and so, uh, but I was I was actually homeless when I, when I was out there. I used to sleep under the pier um, at Huntington Beach down there for like the first couple weeks I was there. Um, but uh, the next day, so I was in California three days and I was in the video game industry. And I would bug the vice president of the company literally like every day. I'm like, hey, whenever you need music, just let me know. I'll do it for free. You know, you don't... You don't have to pay me if you don't like it. You don't lose anything, but at least give me the shot. Let me, you know, give me a, give me an opportunity. And um, me annoying the hell out of them, you know, wore, uh, finally uh, got to them, I guess. But when we were doing the, the very first game that they were working on there was uh, the original Prince of Persia. And so I did the music for uh, Prince of Persia. They liked it. Um, ended up winning a bunch of awards for music, and so they made me the music guy. So that's how, that's how I became, that's how I became uh, involved with music in the video game industry. But the interesting thing, um, I think, to, to kind of take away uh, from my story, uh, which I like to you know tell a lot of people, is um, is that one of the important things about you know going forward in, in whatever career you want to be in, whether you want to be a you know, video game programmer, developer, designer, or a photographer, or a cook, or whatever you want to be, um, is that the first, one of the important things is to really put yourself in uh, an area, a position where there is the most of that, um, you know, the, the most other people doing that. Right, so for me, I wanted to get into entertainment and music. So, I mean, if I was into country music, I would have went to Nashville. If I was into musical theater, the place to go to would be New York, you know. And but for me, I wanted to do like either film scores or rock and roll, something. And that place, you know, that was California. Um, and so, you know, putting yourself in the place because I met more people in like two weeks in California than I met in my entire lifetime, you know, being in Massachusetts. So, so that's really important because the most important thing, if you take away nothing else uh, today, the most important thing that I, that not only in my career, but in knowing a lot of other people, um, in, in either business owners or especially in the entertainment industry, is the most important thing, talent is not the most important thing. 
It really is, and everyone's going to be like, well, it's kind of a controversial thing, but, but it's not. You know, I'll be the only one who will say that out loud and, 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 and admit it. Um, but what's more important or as important as talent is networking. That is the single most important thing. So, again, especially in Hollywood, the entertainment industry, but I would say across everything, again, if you're a photographer trying to get a job or a cook trying to get a certain thing, being able to sell yourself and sell your personality and knowing people who know people, that is more important. You know, by offering to help somebody as like an intern or and say, hey, look, I'll work for free. I just want to be involved. That's a great way to get your foot in the door. That's how I did my first game, right? Prince of Persia. I said, I'll do it for free. There's no risk there at all. If you don't like it, then go hire a professional guy or whatever, you know? And so that's very important when getting your foot in the door. You know, do something and then, and then make yourself um, so important to the people that, oh my gosh, now they, they can't live without you, you know? Like, we have to have you, you know? So um, I think that's, that's a really important thing. And that's kind of, you know, what to take away, I think, uh, from my story. But um, when I started in the video game industry, you know, a lot of the music was, uh, you know, a bunch of bleeps and bloops. And, um, you know, the technology, the, 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 the chips back then, you know, every video game system has an audio chip of some sort on, on you know, on the motherboard, basically. And so when I got involved, I started to kind of learning, like, well, how are people doing this? And back then, there weren't really, there was no such thing as a video game composer uh, really back then. Uh, it was just programmers and basically like at the end of a project, they'd be like, uh, we should probably put some sound in here, <laughs> you know? And uh, you know, they'll, they, may, they might, uh, you know, and again, this is like very early, like days of MIDI, um, where they would, uh, they wouldn't even have MIDI files, but they would like, you know, just type in on a computer keyboard or mouse click in music, you know? I mean, how do you mouse click the blues, you know? Um, and so what I did is when I went in there, um, I says, well, look, guys, there's this thing called MIDI where it's, you know, it's, it's notes, you know, because I asked them, I said, what, what, what information are you putting in the machine? They're basically like, well, it's all math, right? It's all zeros and ones. It's, it's you know, what's the note number out of all this, you know, the note range, the note number? How long do you press it down for? We didn't even have velocity. Velocity, which is like how hard you're pressing it down, you know, light or soft volume control, basically. They didn't even have that. So it was basically two numbers. The note number and how long you pressed it down for. And that was it, right? And so I said, well, geez, that's kind of what MIDI is. You know, MIDI is... When I hit a note on a keyboard, it sends a signal to a, a, a sequencer, a, you know, a, a program which basically records how long and what the note number is, and it also did velocity as well, um, or any pitch, you know, if you, if you did a pitch or whatever. But again, that was we weren't there yet. It was just note number and uh, and how long we held the note for. And so what I did is I says, well, look. Why don't I? Why don't you build me hardware that takes my MIDI keyboard synthesizer, and I want to tap into it right into that chip with with the MIDI cable, and then I could actually play it live. Like I could play it for real because I'm not a computer programmer at all. I mean, you know, when I was growing up in the '70s and '80s, when computers were first starting to enter the home and stuff. You know, I, I would program basic and, you know, stuff like that. Um, you know, dirty text adventures with my friends, you know. <laughs> um, but, um, and so, so I kind of knew the concept of programming, but, you know, I was no, you know, C++ coder, you know. Um, and, um, and so I said, look, why don't you plug right into that? And, and so they did, they built me these, you know, they're about this big, you know, these basically cartridges that would go into like either the Sega Genesis or the Game Boy or the NES, whatever I was working on. And, and there were these big, massive, you know, exposed boards and they would go right to the cartridge slot. And, and a MIDI key, uh, cable would literally plug right into 
the, the, uh, the card. And I was able to play the chip. And then I would use, and this is right when sequencers were coming out, which basically just records MIDI data. And so we were on like Cakewalk 1.0 for DOS. And, um, and so I could then play the chip and record the, it would record the notes I would play and how long I was holding it down for. I would then take that information, because we didn't, they didn't really have MIDI files back then, but uh, it was some form of like ASCII, and then work files that were translated over into ASCII, and then I could see them in a big paragraph in numbers, and then I could start to edit it like that, like, and then translate that into the machine code. So that's how we did uh, you know, music back then, but because I was able to play, I had a completely unfair advantage over everybody else um, because they, you know, they couldn't hear it. They would just have to compile it, play it, listen to it, and, and try to figure out where they made the mistakes. Whereas I was at least able to play blues chords or play you know, you know, real music on a, on a real keyboard, not a computer keyboard. So, um, so that was kind of uh, fun. And then in the um, mid-90s, when CD-ROMs became available um, for storage medium, everything kind of changed because then I could actually record real music and live musicians and this and that. And the budgets weren't there yet, though. Um, I worked on the very first million-dollar budget game. It was a game called Seventh Guest. Um, which was like the first PC CD-ROM game. One, one of the first. It was the biggest selling CD-ROM game. This is before Myst. It was basically like Myst, but before Myst. Um, and, uh, and that was like the first million dollar budget. And so, like to record a big symphony in a studio in LA, like if, you, if you're John Williams and you're recording the next whatever, you know, big movie, he's spending a million dollars just for that, you know? So it's... Um, so we didn't have the big budgets, but I was actually the first guy to ever record a live guitar in, in, for a video game. Um, it was for the Sega CD, you know, the Sega CD system came out and I worked on the Terminator and I was doing live guitar stuff on there. Um, and when we first would do live music and put it on the CD and people would play the game, it was really jarring to them. I mean, I, I remember getting like screaming matches with producers because they're like, well, it doesn't sound like a video game. And I'm like, exactly. You know? <laughs> it's not supposed to, you know, <laughs> they want it to sound like that. It's like, it's a Terminator. You're just walking like that. Um, and, um, and so I, I kind of got away from that whole thing. And even with Prince of Persia, was, my approach was always, um, because I remember them coming to me and they said, look, just give us, there's 15 levels in the game, just give us 15 looping one minute MIDI files. And I said, well, why? Why, why does it have to, like, why, did, let's build drama. Let, you know, video games are so much more than just, oh, let's put some merry-go-round music, you know, in, in the thing. I said, let's not have any music at all in the level. Let's just have, like, sound design. But then when things happen, whether you drink a potion, you pull out your sword, you open a door, you fall and die, there's some kind of cutscene, cinematic, then trigger the music there because then it becomes more important. It's like this is a major thing happening right now. I always say silence is a sound. You know, silence is so important where, like, it, and, and that goes for everything, like, if you're in an action movie, and there's a big action movie, and there's just explosions everywhere, and gunfire, explosions, and everything, it all just kind of gets lost, right? But if you're in that same movie, it's an important scene, and, you, and, and then right before the explosion happens, you cut everything, cut the music, cut the dialogue, cut the sound effects, the wind, everything, just like, boom, and then now it becomes more impactful, right? And so um, dynamics is very important um, with video games. Same thing, like I hate when you play these video games, and uh, they're getting better now. But the worst, uh, the worst one was uh, was Resident Evil, the first one. When you play some of these games where they have like one footstep sound for like everything in the whole <laughs> in the whole damn game, you know, and. Uh, and, uh, and it's really annoying, but you know, footstep sounds are very dynamic, you know. And so when we'll do when we when I do a footstep sound, um, you know, how, what are the different surfaces that the characters are going to be on? Is it wood? Is it carpet? Do they have sneakers? Is it a boot? Is it high heels? Is it barefoot? Is it socks? 
Is it concrete? Is there gravel? Is there dirt? How about grass? And all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh. And you have to record all the different foot varieties. And, and, and uh, so like when I do a game, there's like 2,000 footsteps. You know? And then what we do is I'll do like 20 sounds, 20 different samples, footstep sounds for one surface and one shoe. And then I randomize between those, and then I'll also randomize the pitch a little bit, and I'll randomize the volume as well. Because when you walk, you know, it's not the same exact volume every single time. You know, it depends on your, your, the weight and what you're doing and this and that, or your stop, start, what's the speed? Because when I run, it sounds very different from when I walk. Just the volume alone, right? So there's so all these subtleties and all these um, you know, all these uh, dynamics. And I do the same thing with music as well. Um, you know, dynamics to, to have like, I mean, sometimes you just want it to be high energy, firm from the first bar, boom, three minutes to just in your face, right? But a lot of times, especially with, with symphonic and orchestral music, this, you know, again, pulling things away is great because when you bring everything back in, it's that much more powerful, you know? So um, anyway, uh, so then, you know, mid nineties, uh, we're rolling along there. And then, uh, you know, I worked on some of the stuff in the early nineties that I did, like on the Genesis and Super Nintendo was stuff like uh, Earthworm Jim and, uh, Cool Spot and Latin and Terminator and, uh, all the early Madden football games. And actually I'll tell you a funny Madden football story in regards to the footsteps and dynamics. When we first, um, because some of the, the concepts and stuff are good, but then in the real world, it just doesn't work. But when we were first sitting down with the EA guys, and uh, if, you know, we really want to create like an environment, like it sounds like a football game, you know? And when you, when the ball's hiked, it's just like, ah, oh, you know, all that crashing and foot pounding and all that stuff. So they're like, let's, um, so why don't we give everybody in the game footsteps? So, you know, so, so that, you know, you kind of get that thing. So like, oh, that, you know, let's, let's try it. So we coded it all up. It took us like a day to, you know, sit down with the programmer, get every little animation. Okay, it's the ground now. And we did all that. And then we go to first test it out. And remember, you know, you got like 20 plus people on the field, right? And it's like, it sounded something like this. Blue 52, blue 52, hut, hut. <laughs> <laughs> Bad idea. Well, good idea, just didn't work. Uh, so what we ended up doing is, I said, okay, this is just ridiculous. Um, why don't we give the footstep sound to the person who's holding the ball and the closest defender near him? So that's what, that's what we did, and it, and it worked out fine, you know. And then. What, what I did is I just did like different loops, like random loops of like, oh, yes, I'm going to turn it, you know, like kind of that football sound, and I would just kind of lay that underneath after, after they said hike, I'd just kind of lay this like 30 second loop going, and I'd randomize those, you know. But uh, anyway, uh, so I, and then in the, the mid 90s or late 90s, um, when the CD ROM stuff came out, um, we started doing a lot you know, a lot of, more of like live music and, and recording and stuff like that. And uh, worked on games like the Spider-Man stuff, the James Bond games, the um, Tony Hawk Pro Skater, um, did, did a couple of those. Um, and then in 2000s, did stuff like Metroid Prime. Oh, I did Mortal Kombat stuff. And um, yeah, I worked on Metroid and some of the Sonic games, which suck, but um, <laughs> used to be good, and then to bring it all in the 3D, mess it up. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Sonic should stay in 2D, right? I mean, I'm not, uh, the new one did, though. The new one's good. Yeah. Sonic 4 was good, because they brought it. Generations was pretty good, too. Generations is okay. They're okay. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, Sonic Adventure, I don't know. Screw that. Anyway, um, <laughs> I worked on some crappy ones too. I worked on Sonic and the Black Knight. When, when you're giving Sonic the Hedgehog, when you're giving Sonic the Hedgehog a sword, it's time to cash out. Right? <laughs> time to pass you. You're going faster there. But anyway, um, so yeah. So you know, I've, I've seen technology change like crazy from the time of just basically you know tweaking zeros and ones to now. The technology is really cool in that. When we do games now, um, I'll record a live piece of music. 
I'll, I'll give you an example, like, um, you know, like in film, it's it's linear, right? Film film is is a linear form of storytelling, film and television, and a lot of people ask me why do people why are they so attached to video game music? Why a video game concert? Why a show? What, what why do people uh, enjoy that? And um, there's a couple reasons. First, I think there's the nostalgia factor, right? I mean, when if guys go to the show, guys and girls go check out the show. When when Link comes up on screen for the first time, you're going to get a tear in your eye. You know, it's, it's crazy. Um, you know, it puts you back to that. I hate mean, so many people come up to me after the show and say, "Oh my God, when Zelda came up there, or you know, Pokemon." It's like I remember playing that for the first time with my dad and my old, you know, my old house and my old neighborhood and my old street and, and my friends. Like, there's so much, you know, kind of nostalgia that that takes place, which you know brings back happy, cool feelings. Uh, but the, I think the second one is that when you play a video game, you become that character, right? You're not just watching someone else's adventure. You are the adventure. You're controlling the adventure. You are that person. Therefore, the music, it kind of becomes the soundtrack of your life, of your own life, you know, as you're playing this thing. And it, it kind of to compare it to, to, to film, um, you know, even the great, uh, well, okay, so, Let's say uh, a movie, big, popular, awesome, epic movie like Avatar, right? So Avatar, you watch it, you see it in the theater, a couple hours long, 80% of it is dialogue and talking because that's what film and television are. Is they're telling a story through dialogue. That's their storytelling medium. Whereas with video games, it's interactivity, it's action, it's, you know, we have storytelling as well, but it's more about the interactivity and the action. Uh, so, uh, so you have, you have Avatar, and you've, you've listened to it for two hours, you heard it in the movie theater and stuff, and then maybe six months later you bought the DVD or the Blu-ray, you watched it again, and so you spent a total of maybe four to six hours in the world of Avatar, 80% um, of which was talking. So can anyone here hum me the music to Avatar? No one, right? As epic as that film was. Um, I bet you could hum me Tetris and Mario and Castlevania, though, right? Yeah. There you go, right? So, so, so a film. Now let's let's compare the world of Avatar to say the world of Warcraft, where people play that 10, 20, 30, sometimes 40 hours a week, and the music is in the foreground. See, they call movie music is called background music or incidental music. In video games, I call it foreground music, you know, because we are what drives the action. You, you know, you, you ask most film composers, and I, I know all the big guys, you know, and they'll tell you that their favorite parts of writing music for films are the big opening credits or the big action scenes. Well, we get the action scene every level <laughs> in when, when we do music for the most part, you know. Um, and the other thing that, that really that's different from film and television is that, again, because it's linear media, even the great John Williams, who writes you know, Star Wars, Raiders of the Lost Ark, E.T., Superman, et cetera, et cetera, um, Jaws, even the, Gilligan's Island, true story. Um, <laughs> um, even the great John Williams, at some point, had to sit down with the not so great anymore George Lucas, and <laughs> was there really an indie four? I, I think not. Um, erasing it from delete, delete, delete. Um, but uh, even he has to sit down and say, okay, at one minute and 36 seconds, the music has to do this because Darth Vader just walked through the door. At two minutes and 48 seconds, the music has to do this because the Death Star blows up, right? So John Williams, as a composer, he is completely fenced in by that linear media. He has to write his music exactly to what's on film, and movie music is post-production. They do the film, they finish editing it, and then they give it to the music and sound guys, right? Well, in video games, it's totally different. We're there from the start, and what a, a designer will come to me and say, hey, Tommy, here's a scenario. We got a 
100 guys on horseback with swords all coming to kick your butt, write me a three minute piece of music, right? That's very different. Now I can just, my imagination can go wild and this now. But here's the cool part, is that what I'll do is, when I go to write and record the music, and I'll record, maybe it's a full orchestra, I'll have everybody on a click track. So basically everyone wears a little headset and they're hearing the tempo. The tempo meter is right, you know, like a metronome, is right in their ear. So they know the exact tempo. Um, and so I'll record them. But then what I can do is I can go back and I, I can record them because I will orchestrate the music in maybe five or six different ways. Maybe five or six different in intensity levels. Maybe the violins are doing 16th notes on the big intensity one, but then maybe the next level down, they're only playing eighth notes, and they're playing a little softer. Or maybe the choir, instead of having 50 men and 50 women and a whole children's choir, and they're all going, da, 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 you know, it's all going crazy. Maybe that's the intense level, but then maybe I do different intensities of that. Maybe it's just the females. Maybe it's just a, a solo soprano boy, boy's voice or something, you know, and then, um, you know, you can get all the different, maybe there's no choir. Or maybe with the percussion, maybe it's ten taiko drums going crazy, and then, you know, blue man group, and um, and then maybe it's just a, a small timpani, or maybe it's no percussion. So I can record all these things individually. I can record them as a group or whatever I want to do, however I want to structure it. And then when I when I play the game, because if there's a hundred people on horseback with swords, then maybe I want to change that when there's only fifty people. Change it when there's 10 people. Change it when there's five. Change it when there's one guy left. Change it when finally they're all gone, right? And so what I'll do is I record all these different things and I have all these different layers. And what I'll do is when the level starts, I trigger every single one of them at once so that the timings are all perfect, but I'll mute maybe 80% of them are muted, right? And then I'll tell the programmer, look, when this happens, then do this, you know, if then statement. <laughs> um, so, you know, if bad guy equals 50, then go to line 120, 120, play this music, you know. And so, so everything, you're hearing what I want you to hear, and then as certain things come in or go away, I will bring things in. I just do like a seven second fade of those tracks, you know, in and out. So maybe there's a there's a bass line that's going on and then I'll bring in a guitar or I can bring in percussion, get rid of the guitar. Maybe the, I bring in a different bass line than the one that I have because it's a little more intense, you know? So you can do all these different things. It's just a volume fade. Um, so there's, you know, that aspect and element. Because uh, video games, uh, music really controls, um, it really does control the, the the, the uh, emotion level of the game. I mean, think about it. If you're in a dark room in a video game, depending on what I do as a composer, it's going to dictate to tell the player, signal, signal to the player what they should do. So, for example, if you're in a dark room and I'm playing like kind of like mysterious music, it's kind of like, hey, dummy, go look for a key, you know, kind of <laughs> try to get out of this room because, you know, the music is mysterious. Um, and, and you're wandering around like looking for a key or a light switch or whatever. Um, but if you're in that same dark room and I'm playing like, you know, really intense, oh my God, I'm about to get eaten by a big monster music, well then that's, you know, you're just being in that same room your heartbeat, your level is going to, you know, intensify. I'll tell you, I see this dude with a Space Invader shirt here. I'll tell you, a really cool Space Invaders uh, thing that relates to sound. So the, the, the cat who made uh, Space Invaders uh, over in Japan, I met him a few times. Um, very cool dude. And um, he was telling me that in Space Invaders, now there's four notes in Space Invaders. Dun, 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 dun. Done. That's it. You're done. And then, uh, but the, the beautiful thing about what he did is, and he did a lot of tests, and this was, Space Invaders came out in like 78, I believe, 70, 78 or 79. Uh, somebody Wikipedia that. I'm going to say 78. Could be 77. 77. 78. Anyway, um, whenever, whenever Space Invaders came out, um, he started 
the beat, the tempo, dun, just the sound. And again, this was just bleeps and bloops. Dun, 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 dun. And he started it at, at, your, at a normal person's heart rate. Dun, 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 dun. And then, as they got closer, he started to speed it up. And all the, te and dun, 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 dun. And by the time you're like, ah! you know, these guys were, the final guys racing by. But what he was, what he did is he, he did, uh, he was testing people's heart rates and their heart rate was going in time with the music. People's heart rate would start to speed up as the music started to speed up, you know? So that's, that's how important audio is. And so, you know, making games and stuff like that, make no mistake, you know, Audio is just as important as the graphics and the visuals. Audio is just as important as the storyline, and it's just as important as the interactivity as well. There's four things that make up a video game, right? There's audio, music, sound effects, voiceovers. There's the graphics, the animations, backgrounds, whatever. And there's the gameplay, the fun factor, the most important, right? And, and then there's the some, not all, but and some games have, have a fourth factor, which is uh, storyline and character development and, and things like that. So, I mean, if you didn't have any audio in your game, there's no talking, there's no music, there's no sound effects, it's going to suck, you know? Um, and if, if, you, if you notice, all of the greatest games, pretty much the Metal Gear Solids, the Halos, the Warcrafts, the Assassin's Creed, the Uncharted, the Shadow of the Colossus, they all have great, they all have things in common, right? Great music, great art, great story, great gameplay, great interactivity, right? So I mean, it's it's this formula is simple, you know. And if you're lacking one or two of those things, oh, it wasn't the best graphics. Oh God, the control. You know, the music was great, and I've worked on a lot of these games. Music's great, uh, beautiful graphics, characters are really great, but oh my God, the controls really sucked. What were they thinking, you know? Uh, that will ruin the whole thing. That's the difference between a triple A, great, awesome, hundred million dollar game and something that's in the five dollar bin at, at GameStop is is you know the interactivity is off or whatever. So that, you know, so every one of those elements is is really uh, and again all the time you don't need the best graphics either. You know gameplay is really the the best. I mean look at Tetris right the freaking colored blocks. You know but it's still a like great music though right. Um, <laughs> which we can all hum, uh, and you will hear it tomorrow night. I, actually, if, if you go to the show, we do this, I do this cool thing now with, with Tetris where I, I my, my, my object in creating Video Games Live was, was I wanted to prove to the world how culturally significant and artistic video games have become. And the other side is to help usher in a whole new generation of young people to appreciate you know, the symphony as well. And so I thought it'd be really cool if I said, I explain this on stage. I say, what if I took like an old school video game and turned it into an opera? What would that sound like? And uh, and so we do. I, I I did this whole thing. It's called the Tetris Opera, and the whole thing is is in Russian, and the choir sings it. We have a soloist who sings in Russian. And the whole thing. It's like a, a really cool like five minute piece, but it's all it's all music that you'll know every note of it. You know, it's it's because it's all from Tetris. So. But anyway, um, so that's uh, that's uh, my spiel. Actually, you guys want to see a uh, trailer of, of the show? Because um, it's not just a symphony on stage playing video game music. I want to, again, like the four things I just uh, talked about, graphics, audio, gameplay, character, story. I want to bring all of those to the stage. So I want to incorporate all of those into the show, not just a bunch of old people playing symphony music on stage, you know, that's boring. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I wanted to incorporate rock and roll lighting and special effects and interactive elements with the crowd and uh, the graphics and the video screens and, and everything. So, um, let's say, I got trailer up here. Oh, but uh, this is our Facebook page too. So make sure you check it out. This is, uh, he, was, he was mentioned before, we were, we were at the Eisman Center, this was earlier today. I took a picture from the thing. There's like 1,600 kids there. Wow, it's crazy. Uh, anyway, that's. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. I wanted to, uh, actually, let me go through these things too. I wanted to, real quick, in case you guys don't know about them, you might already. But 
Uh, people say, where's, where's good info to, to get information about getting in the video game industry and that stuff? The, the best resource is, is Gamasutra.com. Uh, I mean, see that programming, art, audio, design, production, biz, marketing. They have like, and, and within any of these, there's literally just thousands of articles and white papers and, and written by people in the industry. So that's cool. But there's even uh, like jobs, resume section, blogs, features. They even have, um, they, they literally list every single game developer in the world on this website by city, state. So you could go in there and say, what's in Dallas? And like 50 video game companies will come up, you know? Because the cool thing is, when I first started working in games, we would literally have like five or six people on the team. There was like one programmer, two artists, an audio dude, and, and like the producer, designer, whatever. And, um, and then in the mid-90s when PlayStation came out and Xbox was coming in, we had teams where there was like two, three hundred people on it. You know, like I worked on some of the Madden stuff, the James Bond games. We had three hundred people at EA all working on one game, you know. Uh, now, now that the phones and everything have come in and mobile and stuff, it's really cool because now it's kind of back, it's full circle. Two, three people in their garage or their dorm room can now make millions of dollars just writing, you know, make, making a, a really a cool app and, and throwing it out there, you know? Um, and so that, that's the good news. The good news is it's so easy not only to get your foot in the door with, with stuff like this. This stuff didn't exist when I was, you know, when I was growing up, but um, not only does resources like this exist. And by the way, go on Amazon and, and do a search for I mean, they have three books just on video game audio, you know, so, um, but if you're in the programming, or game design, or production, there's so many elements uh, in the video game industry, even if it's marketing or, uh, you know, <laughs> lawyers, I mean, they need everything, right? It's always, uh, always cool uh, stuff, but, um, so GD, game developer, or gamasutra.com is a good one. And also, do you guys know about the IGDA, International Game Developers Association? It's all over the world, and they have a they have actually have a Dallas chapter here. So you should definitely check that out. It's a nonprofit organization. Say, well, how can I get in the game industry? How can I get meet the people who are doing what you want to do, right? And what better place than the IGDA chapter meetings in Dallas? Hello, every every month they'll have a chapter meeting. It'll be you know a hundred or so people. Who are doing this for a living already? And uh, you know, great website out there is the Game Developers Conference, gdconf.com. Uh, it happens once a year in San Francisco. It's a week-long thing. It is expensive, um, but not only is San Francisco itself an expensive place to, to visit, uh, but the uh, but this is thirteen thousand of the industry's top game developers from around the world are here. So you'll be walking down the hall and you'll be like, oh, there's Miyamoto. Oh, look, Will Wright. Oh, there's, I mean, it literally is like that. I mean, it's everybody comes together and you will learn more in three days at the Game Developers Conference than, and it's probably bad that I say this, but probably four years of college. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But, but no, I mean, so, so it, uh, and again, I think it's like 1500 for the full pass. But, uh, but they have student things, they have independent games festivals there. It's unbelievable. And the job fair they have here is probably 100 to 150 booths of game publishers and developers looking for people to come and work for. I mean, questions, talk to me. You got some time, yeah. I was wondering how you come up with the set list or the for the show, game. yeah. For the Great show. question. Um, over the last ten years, I started Video Games Live in two thousand and two, and it took me three years to put on the first show. Uh, and the first show I did was at the Hollywood Bowl uh, with the LA Philharmonic. Uh, so I figured I'd start right at the top. And <laughs> the concept of Video Games Live, uh, when I when I first came up with it, and I was telling people about it, everyone thought I was insane. You know, they're like, well, wait a second, what, like, like Philip was saying, people who go to a symphony don't play video games, and people who play video games don't go to a symphony, so you're doubly screwed. Like, what a terrible <laughs> idea. And, um, 
And that was the video game company selling <laughs> I swear to God. I remember sitting at Square Enix in LA going like, yeah, then we're gonna have Final Fantasy when I was pitching them the idea. And they're like, people listen to Final Fantasy music? Square Enix. <laughs> I swear to God, now they got their own concert tour. Good idea, guys. <laughs> Zelda's got one now. Good, good thinking, Nintendo. Yeah, I wonder where you got that idea from. Uh, you wish them all well. Um, but uh, so, so they, uh, and so they, they were like, they didn't even know who Nobu Uematsu was. I'm like, Nobu Uematsu? They're like, who's that? And so, um, anyway, so they all thought it was the same. Again, now this is going back. This is 2002. So this is you know 11 years ago. Uh, before people were buying video games, soundtrack albums, and stuff. Um, so the um, so I so the the concept was was really crazy, and I never took no for an answer. I'm an East Coast Italian, and I was in everybody's face. I'm like, we have to do this. It's going to be great. I'm going to have Tron light cycles zooming across the stage, <laughs> and, which we did. We did do that, and uh, and it, it, it is. It's, it's, it's pretty insane. Um, <laughs> The, uh, and it's going to be all this and that, and, and, and everyone's like, yeah, no one's going to show up, and you don't have the money for this. And so, but, you know, I believed in it, and I took the risk, and we built the whole thing, and people were like, eh, you know what, if you're lucky, 1,000, 2,000 people will show up. Well, 11,000 people showed up for the first show. It was the biggest video game uh, concert in the world at, at that time. Um, they had done video game concerts before over in Japan, but no one had... had you know, done it with video and different games. I mean, when we played that show, it was the very first time ever that the music from Sonic, Kingdom Hearts, Metal Gear Solid, Halo, Warcraft, Myst, had ever been performed live anywhere. Even in Japan, no one had ever done Kingdom Hearts and Metal Gear. And you, you'd think it's Sonic. But um, anyway, so we, we did uh, the big show there. And so I, over the years, I changed the show every year. So I have over 100 segments now in Video Games Live that we created. And so what I did, for example, for this show, because uh, we've been to Dallas, I think it's our third time back. We, we've done Dallas twice with the Dallas Symphony, I think in 2007, 2008. Then we played Fort Worth as well at the Bass Hall there a couple of years ago. Um, and now, now we're, we're playing Richardson. So I looked at all the set lists that we had previously done, and then I might take one or two of the favorites, something like, oh, okay, Castlevania, or Chrono Trigger, Chrono Cross, whatever, you know. I'll, I'll move those over. Um, and then I either go on Facebook, and we have a, <coughs> our uh, events page on Facebook, and I'll just ask people, what do you want to hear? Um, or, and, and then I'll, I'll kind of take that, and I'll use kind of all the new stuff that we've worked on. Like, for example, uh, this past year, I mean, stuff like Skyrim has come out. I told you about that Tetris Opera. Um, games like Journey, you know, on the PlayStation 3 and stuff. So Grammy-nominated Journey, the first, first video game score to ever be nominated for a Grammy. Um, and, so, uh, and so I'll just do that. And then now the music that I'm working on this year you know, we'll bring that back, you know, when we, when we come back again. So, uh, like right now, just to give you an idea, on um, because uh, we do, like, now we do stuff like Shadow of the Colossus, Pokemon, Skyrim, Journey, Earthworm Jim, you know, I worked on, uh, is going to be in the show. The, um, and then, uh, but some of the stuff I'm working on now, I, I want to do this really epic, completely delightfully strange and weird Katamari Damacy segment. <laughs> I want it to be like so freaky acid trip that like people can be like, what the hell did I just see? What is going on here? So and, and what better game to do that? Or, you know, uh, so I'm working on that. Uh, Earthbound, if you guys know. Yes. Mother as it's called in uh, Japan. Uh, but anyway, um, we're gonna a bunch of bunch of cool stuff now. So so yeah, I'm just always adding stuff to the show, always working on uh, new stuff and asking the people what they want to hear, basically. Yeah. Uh, if you want to get into composing for video games, yes. Uh, what are some? Uh, what would you recommend studying? I recommend this. Any pandas? Pandas? No, no. 
Make friends with pandas. Network with pandas. <laughs> if you want to go to audiogang.org. Audio Gang. Gang Gangs uh, stands for the Game Audio Network Guild. Game Audio Network Guild. Gang. And it's uh, audiogang.org. It's a nonprofit organization. Um, there's over 2,500 people in, in gang all over the world. Um, there's student memberships as well and apprentice. There's tons of, so many people have gotten jobs and so much great information. It's like the Facebook of game audio community, basically. Um, and this is an organization that I started uh, 11 years ago, right before I started Video Games Live. Uh, we launched this. And um, yeah, it's really super uh, successful. I would say that's one. Uh, the other thing is there's two fantastic books out there on uh, Amazon. Uh, one of them's called The Complete Guide to Game Audio. Boom, right? And then uh, Alexander Brandon has a book called yeah, Audio for Games, Planning, Process, and Production by Alexander Brandon. There's a guy, he did uh, music for KSX. He's actually one of the voiceover characters in Skyrim. But uh, he's known for, he did the original Unreal. I did Unreal 2, he did Unreal 1. Um, so that's another great book as well, too. Uh, and then go to the Game Developers Conference. That's where we have the gang awards there. So you'll be in a room with a thousand game audio people. The head of EA, the head of Blizzard, the head of Activision Music, all the heads of all the different companies are sitting right there in the room. And we're all approachable and all just hanging out and having a good time. And, you know, talking to those people. You know. How do you think that having more access to more people with interest in scoring, in development, et cetera, has changed the environment of trying to get into this industry? Yeah, well, because there's so many, like, people, Games have become so big and there's so much riding on it, right? So if you're going to spend 20, 30, 40 million dollars making a game, and if you're a producer of the game or a director or a designer or whatever, you want people you can trust, you know? And that's where, again, the networking thing comes in. You could have the most epic game demo ever, but if that person has never worked with you, there's like that level of, Oh my God, they would rather use somebody else who maybe isn't as good, but they know works hard and gets the job done and they're their friend, you know? Um, and so, so you know, that, that's, that's one thing. And, and again, with the networking thing, you know, sending somebody an email or liking somebody on Facebook really just is not enough in this world. It just, it means nothing. It's like in the, in the old days, 70s and 80s record companies would get de demo tapes as if there's a some cat in the back room like going some dude like oh yeah this is great We're, who 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 sent this in you know it's just like Pfft. you know so if it, it's and it's like that today with email if I get it I'll tell you right now if I get an email of somebody uh, I don't know I mean because I have 400 emails of people I do know that I have to deal with. You know, and so that's why it's so important to get in front of somebody. You know, making that personal connection. Um, and, and a lot of that has gone away, so use that to your advantage, right? Everybody just wants to send an email. Oh, here's a link to my MP3 file. Listen, could you listen to it? You know, um, whereas meeting somebody in person, get, you know, building, uh, uh, you know, a face-to-face -face relationship and then handing somebody something, is way better than just sending somebody a blind email, you know. So, um, you know, so you, I would say, you know, use that uh, to your advantage. Yeah. Uh, how did you get into music yourself? Like, I know you were talking about how. How did I get into music? Yeah. Like, you can play piano or. Yeah, I, I've been playing piano since I was three, so 41, 42 years. Um, I've been playing guitar since I was about five or six. And uh, I come from a very famous. Uh, music background, so music was always in my uh, lineage, if you will. Um, I was always into rock and roll. My, my cousin, Stephen Tyler, from Aerosmith, his, uh, his real name is Stephen Tellerigo. At least that's what his Wikipedia page says, anyway. I <laughs> uh, no, and so I, I kind of grew up around, so I, I would go to like an Aerosmith show and see 
Cousin Stephen performing for like 30,000 people, and it didn't really like, to me, I, and we, me and him always talk about this, when, when people say, oh, did he help you in your career? And I, not really, I didn't, you know, I didn't ask for, it, for his help, but where he helped me the most was, I would see him performing on stage to millions of people, and to me it was never like an impossible dream, you know, so that's what he gave me, you know, it is like, I'd be like, oh, yeah, Cousin Steven can do it. Boy, that looks like fun. That's what I want to do someday, you know? So I never thought that it was an impossible thing. And by the way, it's not, and everybody here should have that same mindset, right? Nothing is impossible. I can really do whatever I want as long as I set my mind to it, and I don't think that I can't do it. You know what I mean? Um, but, uh, but I never went to school for music. <laughs> It's a really great thing to say at a college. Kids, don't go to school. <laughs> Basically, drop out now, move to California, and be homeless. <laughs> uh, easy, cool. Uh, but I never went to school for music. I, I just I always played by ear. Uh, for me, I wanted to always impress my mom and dad, right? As as most of us do as as children, and even now. Um, the uh, and so my parents were a product of the fifties. So they loved Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee Lewis, you know? And so I would, I would be banging out like Jailhouse Rock and Great Balls of Fire when I was like five to you know, impress my mom. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what's going on? So I would just like listen to the music and then, um, you know, and then try to figure it out on, on the piano. And then as I got the same thing with guitar, I listened to Aerosmith, Led Zeppelin, Van Halen, and, and just try to mimic what I was you know, hearing. Um, and then even <laughs> to carry that forward, and then when I started, you know, composing symphony scores, I, symphonic scores, I do the same thing. I go and listen to John Williams and Beethoven, and you know, we all get inspired by the masters. You know, that's a nice way of saying ripping off, um, <laughs> stealing, whatever you want. You know, just ripping off. No, but you know, you get inspired by you know, and, and so I would listen to Beethoven's Ninth, which to me is still to this day I think is the greatest piece of music ever written. I mean, everybody knows it, da 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 da, da right? I want everyone to, to go, to, when, next time you get a chance or on YouTube tonight, go and listen to that song. I mean, listen to it. Don't just like have it in the background and, and don't just listen to the melody. Da 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 da. Listen to all the stuff that's going on before and during that. Listen to what the strings are doing while every while they're singing. Da 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 da. You're gonna hear so much amazing thing in that piece of music. And the way, and that's where Beethoven was was really a genius and a mastermind. He was able to hear a hundred different instruments all doing different things at the same time in his head, and then hand write out each and every one of them. Unbelievable. Imagine if dude had a sequencer, like, you know, if he had like mini keyboards, he would have been on fire. Uh, but, and those cats were the, they were the rock stars of their time, you know. People always say to me, sometimes like, I'll get, uh, uh, I'll get some like smart aleck reporter who's like, oh, do you really think video games or art, you know, and, and uh, you know, why, why then do you have to have the video and the, music, or the, the video and the lasers and all that, is, is that so you keep people's attention because the music isn't that good, you know, whatever. And, uh, and I quickly remind them that, you know, um, when Tchaikovsky debuted the 1812 Overture, in 1812, um, he had live cannons on stage firing at the appropriate times. You know, so make no mistakes, if any of these dudes were around now, Beethoven, Mozart, Liszt, They'd all be using lasers and video screens. And by the way, it was a bunch of Italians a couple hundred years ago who sat around a table and said, how do we make the symphony more interesting? And one dude said, hey, I got an idea. Why don't we, uh, why don't we tell a story through the lyrics? And another guy said, oh, why don't we dress them up in costumes? Yeah, let's create sets on stage, too. And oh, my gosh, this is so avant-garde. And, uh, and that's how opera was created. You know, and now we think opera is like, you know, something from hundreds of years ago. So I, I always say with video games live, it's like the opera of the 21st century. I basically want to use all the stuff that we grew up on, right? And I say we because we're under 45. Um, <laughs> and, 
And uh, because of not my generation, we were the first to grow up on video games, right? We were the first real generation. When I was 10 years old, Star Wars came out, and I was playing Space Invaders. Was Space Invaders 78? 78. 78. 78. 78. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so when Space Invaders and all that stuff was, was coming out, that was right home. When, when you're 10 years old and the first Star Wars comes out, I mean, the real first Star Wars comes out. I mean, that's like mind blowing. And then Tron comes out in 1981. Are you kidding me? A movie about video games? Oh, my God. So um, I was hooked. But um, anyway, questions, other questions? Yeah. Um, I was wondering what was your favorite soundtrack that you worked on and your favorite soundtrack that you didn't work on? Favorite soundtrack that I worked on is probably Earthworm Jim, uh, just because of the fun we had. There was no restrictions, nobody telling me over my shoulder, could you make it sound more like this, you know? Um, that was fun, and also Advent Rising, which is a, one of those games that I mentioned that had like everything great except the controls. Uh, <laughs> but, because um, Advent Rising, I wrote a two and a half hour Italian opera. It was something that I always wanted to do, so that gave me the excuse. <laughs> I was just waiting to plant it somewhere. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and so, yeah, so I, I uh, those are my favorite that I worked on. Um, but my favorite game score of all time um, is uh, Nobuo Matsu's soundtrack to Final Fantasy VIII. Yeah. Eight is my favorite. Liberate Fatali, Eyes on Me, uh, Eris the, or no, Eris 7. Uh, there's a bunch of tools. Anyway, uh, 8 as a, as a body of work, I think, is is better than 7 um, to me. I'm not talking the game, just as the soundtrack. So 7 is a very close second for me. For me. But, uh, and then, you know, how can you not love Mario? I mean, you know, that's another one where as soon as it comes up, your whole ch attitude changes, you know? Yo! Real quick, uh, your opinion on Final Fantasy IX? This is talking about a game. The music or the game? Either. Yeah, the game sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, I mean, I, I'll be totally honest with you here. I love the Final Fantasy characters. I love the cutscenes, the cinematics. I love the movies. You know, I love the music, obviously. Um, I never liked the Final Fantasy games. I just, I don't like turn-based strat, you know, turn-based games at all. You know, I, it's just not my thing, personally. I'm not saying they, they suck, I just, you know, I, but I, I, I played them all, and I just, it's always a chore for me. And talk about one footstep sound. Oh, time, drive me up the wall. But, uh, but, but the cinematics and the stories, I mean, Advent Children, the, the, the Blu-ray is pretty awesome. So, I mean, I love, I love the world. I just don't, it, it, you know what it is? It's one of those games where I, I would rather prefer watching somebody else play it. Like, that's a cool game to watch somebody play. Same with Shadow of the Colossus. I can sit there and watch somebody play Shadow of the Colossus, and it's like so cool. Red Dead Redemption, another one. Like, I just like watching it, you know? But, um, but I, I, don't, I don't like playing Final Fantasy games. Um, but I love the games. That makes any sense at all. Uh, yeah. What was the most difficult game in your career? Color of Dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> Color of Dinosaur was the most difficult because um, it was, I think, 1990, and I just started working on video games. And the guy came to my office, I remember him saying, he's like, hey look, we've got this game we've been working on for like six months in some back room, and it's like, it was like Mario Paint, but really crap. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't a tenth of what Mario Paint was, it was coming out after. And it was just these really bad dinosaurs, and you're supposed to color the dinosaur, but the, the patterns were just awful. Plaid, pinks, and greens, and purple. It was horrible. And then when you, when you colored them, there was no, there was no, uh, it was supposed to be for kids, obviously, but still. Um, and it would like color outside the lines. It was terrible. And, um, um, and, and then there was no memory. There was no cart, the, the battery backup either. So you couldn't save any of the great, wait, hold on. <laughs> and so he came to me and, he, and, and this dude said um, he's like he's like hey we gotta submit this tomorrow to Nintendo <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I'm like really and, and I had never worked on an NES game right so I had to learn a 
a whole new sound audio driver and write the music to this awesome <laughs> game. And uh, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty good. Uh, oh, look, it comes up. Yeah! <laughs> All right. Wikipedia. Oh, we got on Wikipedia. There it is. Oh, great. Thanks, Wikipedia. Tommy Tallarico did the music for this one. <laughs> Microsoft released the Illuma yeah. Room. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that is cool. That have you guys seen it all? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Really amazing. I, I think that is is awesome. I mean, is it going to be the next big thing? Um, you know, I mean, you need a projector. And, <laughs> and, you know, it's like um, you know. To me, it's like at the end of the day, it's it's all about gameplay to me because like even. Uh, I just, you know, all this Wii stuff, and, you know, the, the, the Connect and the PS, you know, the, you know, the, the Move, the PS Move, I mean, really? I mean, it's, it's, it's cool for about 20 minutes, yeah. <laughs> and then, like, like, do you know anyone who still plays Wii Bowling? Anyone? You? Yes. Oh, Phil. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> uh, but, but, I mean, it, it's something that's really cool, and, you know, some of the dance games and stuff are cool, but, I mean, come on, like, can you, could you ever play, like, Tony Hawk or, or a driving game? Like, you know, you're talking about pixel-perfect accuracy that, you know, that you need with a controller, so, you know, I, I think it's all kind of, it, it's a cool add-on, but people say, oh, isn't this the wave of the future, is this? Hell no, come on. You know, we're all gamers here. You play Assassin's Creed like that. Go ahead, try it. <laughs> <laughs> the damn thing ain't... Look, I, I get so frustrated. Even on my Kinect, which is great. Kinect's probably the best out of all of them. And, you, you know, you, you all got... You know, you play Kinect, right? And you're, like, trying to just... Just go try to go through a menu screen. I'm like, the, the, huh? Son of a... The damn... There it is. Oh! You know, like... <laughs> Instead of just hitting the button to go to the next <laughs> menu, I mean, really, you know. So anyway, um, but I mean, that Luma Room thing is really, really cool. Do I think it's the future of games? Uh, maybe I don't know, but you know, I mean, I remember being in meetings like 15 years ago, and people were like, "The future of gaming, they have this smell of vision, and we have this, and it was literally a box, and you hooked it up to your gaming system, and when you when it fired." It smelled like fire, and it's like burn matches. And then, and then when you're in the when you're in the woods, it'll and it threw out some like you know pine scented, it smelled like comet or something, and, and, it, and it smelled like an air freshener from your car or something. And, and you know, it's, it did all these things. It's like, and it was kind of a cool thing at first, and I was like, yeah, and then it went away. Um, so, uh, but I think that Luma Room is 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 really uh, is really intense. But again. It's it's a wow factor demo. Like if you if you watch the demo and you're like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. Look at the explosion thing and the room's going like this. Okay, but play a game for six hours with that. You know? I think it might get a little maybe hard on the eyes or, or whatever. So I don't think like you know, every game from now on is gonna be like that. It'll it'll come and go and it'll be like super cool, but um, No, no, not not that kind of stuff. Not really, because that's that's just all like visual, you know, kind of candy cherry on top kind of stuff. Yeah, it, it doesn't. I mean, because we do three D immersion stuff. We've been doing that since the late '90s, you know, with 
um, you know, like you play a game like Halo, for example, and you can tell there's a guy behind you just by the sound, you know, and turn around, you know, Rainbow Six was always a great, great game for that, where it's like, whoa, you know, there's, there's people coming up from behind. Uh, and so you knew to turn just from the audio cue, you know. So that's cool. We've been doing that for a while, and that's that's important. But yeah, we kind of already have that with five one surround now. It, it makes that a lot easier, obviously. Um, but you know, do I think there's going to be seven one or ten point two? You know, um, you know. I mean, they've tried. They, they even tried to go to seven point one, and it, it didn't work out too well. So. Uh, five one is, I think, where we're at at least for the next, you know, at least five or ten years. But, yeah, uh, but the future of gaming is is going to be a, a lot of the stuff's going to be the cloud gaming stuff. You know, software is going to go away. Physical software, you know, I can tell you, PlayStation Four is it's all going to be downloadable cloud, playing in the cloud. You're going to have a box, and you're just going to log in, and all your world, all your data, all your stuff's going to be there. A lot of downloadable content. It's always it's going to be you know more organic, more growing and living and breathing you know kind of kind of thing instead of just here's my disc that I bought at GameStop. I'm putting it in. And, you know that's it. It's it's going to be a lot more. And I I know that guys are working on PS4, and the Xbox 370, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> 720. Yeah. Uh, you said you had a lot of stuff going on there throughout your life, throughout your career. Yeah. You're pretty busy all the time. Do you ever get a lot of time to play video games? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm playing all the time, you know, um, especially over Christmas is my catch up time. But but yeah, I mean, I still haven't got through Uncharted 3 yet. Um, we're, uh, God, what are we playing? We played that, what's that? <coughs> Tokyo, the one with the animals? Yeah, Tokyo, Tokyo Jungle. Jungo. Tokyo Jungle. We were playing that. It was, uh, we, we love, you know, we love animals. We met my girlfriend and, and uh, and so we're like, oh, let's be a little Pomeranian and stuff. So uh, it kind of sucked. Uh, but uh, I, I actually, I just started playing uh, Shadow of the Colossus again because I got the you know the HD version, which came out a couple of years ago. I'm like, oh man, I want to play that again from the beginning in HD. So, um, but yeah, we're you know we're always and on the bus, like we have a you know traveling bus. We're playing here tomorrow, and then the next morning, like seven hours later, we start setting up. For our show in Lafayette, Louisiana. So we, we we set up in the morning. So we get in. There's a the stage is like completely clear. There's nothing set up, and we're, we're there at eight in the morning. We're setting up light. We're setting up the stage. Setting up the click track. Setting up the screens. Doing all the audio, all the special effects. Getting the rehearsal, the music parts ready. Click tracks up. Microphones up. Boom, 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 boom. All that by twelve o'clock. And then we have our choir rehearsal. Then we have the orchestra on stage doing the tech rehearsal with the choir, getting all the mix down, everything right. Then we boom, and that's done at about six. The show starts at 6.37. Now we do the show. Then after that, we do the meet and greet where we stay after, meet everybody. It takes about two hours to get through the line, two, three hours. Now it's midnight, and then we get right on the bus. We sleep while the driver drives, and we show up in Lafayette and do it again. We did uh, we did ten shows in fourteen days across Canada a couple months ago. Yeah, that was insane. That was awesome, but it was insane. But um, and then we we played. We had one run uh, this summer. We went to uh, China and we went to Chile and Bra did four or five shows in Brazil. Then to Canada did the ten run ten show run in Canada. Uh, and then Dubai and then. Colorado, the whole upper northwest, Oregon, Colorado, Idaho, Wyoming. Uh, so that was crazy. And then, again, yeah, you're all on a bus. So when we're on the bus, though, a lot of times you're on a bus for 17 hours getting from point A to point B, there's a PlayStation and Xbox that we have hooked up uh, in the bus. So, you know, and it's online and everything. So, yeah, so we play on the bus a lot. Bill, yeah. okay? Two minutes? Oh, okay. Yep. Um, what would you say would be like, your favorite game? Favorite game, Red Dead Redemption, I think, is like an immersive, living, breathing world. I love that game. I think I could play, if I had to go to a desert island, you know, and just have one game to take with me, I'd take that one because it's so, you know, so many different things you can do. Shadow of the Colossus is up there, Beyond Good and Evil, which I mentioned. Uh, but Super Mario World, I think, is the perfect, you know, to me, is like everything about it, the design, the the jump 
dynamic, the, the jump mechanics, the level design, the layout, the characters, the music, the, you know, everything. I thought Miyamoto, that was his, like, you know, that was it. That was his Beethoven's night. <laughs> yeah. Uh, besides Nobuo Uematsu, who are some other video game composers you uh, Koji Kondo is the guy who did Mario and Zelda and uh, Star Fox and stuff like that. Uh, he, he's great. Um, there's uh, uh, Russell Brower and Jason Hayes, are the guys who do most of the, uh, the, the Blizzard stuff, which is unbelievable music. I mean, really incredible stuff. We plan some of it uh, tomorrow. Um, Jeremy Soule, who does Skyrim and things like that. Gerard Marino does a lot of the Guy of War stuff. Marty O'Donnell who does Halo. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a there's a bunch of really uh, really talented folks out there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what annoys you most as someone who does music? Uh, with the repeating footstep thing is like a sore <laughs> spot. With me. I hate that because it totally takes me out of the experience. You like you want to be immersed in this world. And again, play a game like Red Dead Redemption, the sound is so perfect. Everything from the, the way the horse moves, to the footstep sounds, to the, you know, I mean, everything is, to the way the wind blows. I mean, it's just, it's unbelievable. And then when you have the game, it's like, and then bad acting too, really annoys me. So again, the first Resident Evil, loved the game, was ahead of its time, but boy, did it have horrible audio. And that horrible, I go back and play Resident Evil now, and you'll be like, oh my god, you know, the master of unlocking, you know, and it's like, it's really horrible. Yes. All right, what's your stupid fun game? Your, your favorite game that you like to play, and it has no consequence whatsoever? Yeah, yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I like uh, stupid fun. Uh, let me, hold on, let me check on my phone. It's probably on my phone somewhere. Um... I have, I have uh, games. I know, I'm, uh, oh, uh, yeah, Robot Unicorn Attack. <laughs> That's a good one. I love that score, too. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, when you're working on a game, at what point do you know if it's terrible or not? Like when you know, it's tough because when you when you uh, when you design when you're you know making games, um, you're playing the thing broken for two years, and it all all of the coolness doesn't come together like until the last month, you know, where they're tweaking everything and getting it good. Like when we were working on Tony Hawk Pro Skater, we had no idea. We're just like, that's nah, a skateboarding game. You know, we thought that it would sell maybe 250,000 units across all the platforms. Well, it sold 11 million units just on the PlayStation alone. So it sold over 25 million units in its total. Yeah. And yeah, that helped pay for a lot of fun stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we're out of time. Any, any last question? Anyone? Yes, right here. Um, from all the concerts, uh, kind of video games, live concerts, what is the song you get the Usually the most response. That's a great. That's a great question. Which one gets the most response? Um, I can tell you what. Um, I mean, everyone loves Mario, Zelda, Final Fantasy, Halo, Warcraft. You know, like 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 I said. But the one I think that gets a really big response because I don't think people are expecting it. Um, and and I usually play it in the encore because people don't expect it. Is uh, Chrono Cross and Chrono Trigger. Yes. Yeah, for those of you who know it, and a lot of people don't even know that game. Gamers know that game, and they know that <laughs> score and that soundtrack. And I, I do an acoustic guitar thing for, uh, you know, the opening of, uh, you know, Chrono Cross opening, you know, with the guitar and everything. It's, it's really cool. Man, cool. All right.